Test. Test. Good morning, everyone. Welcome morning. to Mount Pisgah. It's great to see you. We'd like to also send out a warm welcome to those that are joining us on Facebook and just let you know we miss seeing your faces here as well. So we'd love to see you come back and sit beside us and worship with us. So um, first thing I'd like to let everybody know, we did our voting last week for our new deacons. And the new deacons are Annette Cogburn, Ron Hensley, and Ray Lewis, Jr. So looking forward to, to having you guys join the team. Um, if you'll notice on the back, we have a fundraiser coming up, Fish Fry, that's hosted by the Baptist Men, September the 23rd, 4 to 7, here in the Fellowship Hall. Also, I think there's a car wash too, but um, I'm sure Butch will be sharing more of that. Reminder, church photo directory. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the hallway. Thursday, September 21st, 5 to 8. Friday, the 22nd, 5 to 8. And then Saturday, the 23rd, from 10 to 2. Reminder, church office is closed Monday for Labor Day. We will have Wednesday night Bible study. And the women on mission are having their luncheon and meeting on September 10th following worship. You'll notice the birthdays, Tommy Smith and Annette Cogburn, and then Sam and Annette have an anniversary coming up. Great. And then if you'll notice the prayer list also. I've got some updates for you. Um, found out this morning when I came in, Nick Smith is admitted into the hospital. He's in Cape Fear, 826 South. He is um, having AFib and some fluid around his heart and also some stomach issues. So please, please remember him in prayer. Um, update on Doris. Jim has asked for no more, no visitors. Texting, calling still is good. She is, I'm sorry. Hospice is coming every day now. She's bedridden. Um, it's, and the hospice folks are saying it's, it, it could be any time now. So please, please keep Jim and that family and Doris in your prayers. Um, I got a phone call this morning from my mom, my dad's sister, my Aunt Betty Lou, is waiting on a bed in Pinehurst. She's in kidney failure. And they've said that there's nothing else they can do for her either. So um, please, just keep all of these people in your prayers, their families, and our church family as well as we go through this difficult time. Um, Butch has something he'd like to add. Hey, thank you, Robin. Hey, lots of uh, prayers needed out there, y'all. Uh, just keep, keep these families in your prayers. And and uh, keep, keep lifting them up. Uh, but I got a praise report, okay? Uh, the, the Baptist men, uh, for the past eight years, have uh, supported the Fair Workers Ministry. Uh, we had another very successful day yesterday. We handed out 80 hot dogs, probably about 175 waters, um, hygiene supplies, some clothing, and stuff like that. I want to thank uh, Grady Adams, Shane Young, John L. Averitt, uh, as, as they were hands-on and helped in, in serving and providing that. Uh, there's lots of folks behind the scenes who donated money, who donated supplies, and things of that nature. I want to thank you guys for that as well. Um, this is an ongoing thing with us. Uh, you can always uh, write on your uh, donations, uh, your ties uh, to the Brotherhood, or for the women on the mission. They, they do similar. Uh, you know, we're always looking for donations so we can keep on these ministries. It's always a good thing. Uh, and that's it. It was a great day. It was beautiful weather. The Lord has always provided for us. So. Thank you, guys. Please stand for our hymn of praise. Oh, Jesus, I have
Would you pray with me? Oh Lord God, you are a God who does indeed speak to us each and every day of our lives. You speak to us Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And Lord, you speak to us on this day as well. As we have gathered here in your house, Lord, we've gathered with hopeful hearts and ready minds to hear you. And maybe perhaps to be able to acknowledge where you have spoken to us throughout the course of the week. I pray, Lord, that we will hear you, that we will set aside all that might be distracting us from your voice and your love in our lives, and that we will hear, and when the time comes for us to depart and go back into our lives, that we will be able to respond to you in faith and love. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of celebration. Where are you standing down for? Stand back up. <laughs> Our hymn of celebration is Seek Ye First. Let's sing together. It is a pleasure to be with you again and to have this opportunity for worship. Um, this morning as I came in, I could um, heard a couple of folks sharing with some very real and um, close to the heart concerns that you're feeling for um, a few of your uh, members of your family. And um, I, I hurt for you and um, the concerns that you are feeling. Um, one of the things that I have learned is that um, it is so important for us to be kind in our lives because everyone you meet is carrying or fighting a great battle. Um, and you just never know what people are going through at any given time. Um, as we come to a time of prayer, uh, I know it is your tradition, and I, I love this about your worship of spending a moment first in silence in reflection on the week that was and thinking about the opportunities that perhaps you had to uh, hear God's voice and, and perhaps may have fallen a bit short, uh, perhaps um, went in the other direction or perhaps so consumed with life that you didn't hear the Lord. Um, but to offer that to God in confession and ask for forgiveness. Um, but for them to uh, conclude that time of prayer with a prayer and then the Lord's um, prayer spoken together. Um, as we go into this time, I'm going to ask you to do the obvious and just simply to offer that prayer of confession, but also uh, to remember your friends and your uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who are in uh, difficult times such as now, and to pray for God's blessings on your church. Uh, so would you pray with me?
Oh Lord, we don't need to come to church just to hear you speak. You speak to us each and every day in the most common of conversations, in the most daily of experiences. Some of us may have risen early one, this, this, that one day this week and saw a beautiful sunrise. Others may have gotten a special hug from a grandchild. Others may have had just a simple kind word spoken to them, perhaps from a complete stranger. And Lord, we are all grateful for your provision and care and grace for us through the storm this week. We pray for those who, whose property or whose lives were endangered in some way. But we thank you, O oh Lord, that you have provided for us. You have spoken to us this week in our families, in our reading of Scripture, in our prayers. And I wonder, Lord, if you've also spoken to us in our workplaces, spoken to us and given us the opportunity to express our love for you and the work that we do in the conversations that we have with our co-workers, with our clients, with our customers. Lord, help us to see that there is no part of our life that you are to be separated from. You are to be welcomed in all that we are and all that we do and say. And in this weekend where we celebrate the privilege that we have to go to work, to make a living, to provide for ourselves and our families, and perhaps provide for others. Help us to see our work, O oh Lord, as just one more way in which we can be your servants, where you can use us to grow the kingdom of God in this world and in our lives. Lord, today I join with this church family and I all ask for your provision and your care for these who are facing illness, who are perhaps experiencing grief and uncertainty about the way forward. Lord, I pray that you would help them to know that they are held by your spirit in response to the prayers of these, their brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would soothe every hurting heart, that you would give peace to every puzzled mind, and that you would open our hearts and our voices to those who need encouragement. We pray this in keeping with the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
God's children said, Amen. Amen. It's been said that the one who sings prays twice. Your music, Gwen, is obviously a prayer, and thank you for praying for all of us. There are two passages of Scripture I would like to share with you today. The first is from the second chapter of Genesis and then from Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. First, Genesis chapter 2, beginning with the second half of verse 4 through 9. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, 
and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise up from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And then verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And now hear Paul's words to a very specific group of people in the church in Colossae. This is from the third chapter, verses 22 through 24. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever your task, put yourselves into it as done for the Lord and not for your masters. <coughs> These are the words of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious and Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and hearts once again to ask not only that you would speak, but that you would give us the discipline to listen, to hear you, to know how you would have us live our lives in these days. Lord, I pray that your spirit would fill our hearts with your love, our minds with your truth, our spirits with your power, our bodies with your strength, and our souls with your peace, and shape us in the image of Christ our Lord. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. It is a real pleasure to be with you again. This is the third Sunday I think I've had the opportunity to, to be with you and to join you in worship. And although we do not know each other real well, some of you know that I, am, uh, that I live in Lumberton and um, uh, have lived there for many years. But for those of you who don't know, and, and perhaps let me reintroduce myself, um, my name is David Elks. I'm a life and leadership coach and chaplain and I work for Rust Enterprises. Rust Enterprises is the owner-operator of nine McDonald's restaurants in Robeson, Bladen, and Columbus counties. Now, when I tell people that I'm a chaplain and I work for McDonald's, the first response I always get was, is, oh, I didn't know McDonald's had chaplains. And my answer is, McDonald's doesn't. The truth is, I am it. The brand McDonald's does not have a chaplaincy program, and there are very few, if any, other owner-operators who have embraced the idea. But the people that I work for, the Rust family, believe in taking care of their employees, and they do so in a lot of different ways, and one way in which is in which they've hired me to come along and to be a pastor to the uh, employees, but also to be a friend, to support them, to encourage them, to listen to them, and to guide them along life's way, both in the business, but also in their lives. My job as a life and leadership coach, both in the company and in my own practice, is simply to help people make good decisions. Well. When you put all of our nine restaurants together, we have about 700 employees. And I would love to be able to tell you that I know every one of them by name, but I don't. And I would also love to tell you that I don't have any favorites, but that's not true either. I do have a few favorite employees that I love to visit, and Lynette is one of them. 
Well, Annette is a Native American. She is a hard worker. She's been with the company for several years. She's a devoted mother, and she is a devoted Christian as well. Each time I go to see uh, the folks in her store and I speak with Lynette, if I have a few extra minutes and she can pull away from her responsibilities, she wants to tell me about what's going on in her family, but most recently she'll tell me sometimes about the sermon that she's most recently heard. Well, this week I saw Lynette, and she came up to me and said, uh, Pastor, I, I want to tell you um, about what I heard the preacher talking about this Sunday. And she started to tell me about what her preacher had spoken about. And I was impressed that she had heard the sermon, and she had really gotten a lot from it. And she started talking about original sin. And she said, you, the preacher was talking about how, um, how when... when humans were made, were, when, when man came into this world, that they were sinful. And, and she started going into that line of thought and talking about the sinful nature of, of men and women when we were created. And as she was talking, I, I just kind of was a little puzzled at first. And I, I looked back at her and I said, Lynette, are, are you sure about that? Are, are you sure we were created sinful? Now, she looked at me as though I was one nugget short of a happy meal. And she said, well, Pastor, you have heard of original sin, haven't you? I said, oh, yes, I've, I've heard the concept. I've studied it. I've read all about it. And all, but I said, but, you know, in, in all honesty, it just doesn't make much sense to me. And in all honesty, when I read the Bible, it's not what I see in the Scripture either. And she gave me that look again. I said, well, just let's think about it this way. Think about Genesis 1. You remember the creation story. And you remember that there are six days of creation. Now think with me for just a moment. After each day of creation, God creates... And then God steps back and takes a look. And what does God say? It is good. For five days, it is good. 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 For five days. And then on the sixth day, on the sixth day, this beautiful world has been created, but there's something very important missing. And so God creates humanity. And when God creates humanity, God looks back, steps back, and he doesn't just say it is good, but rather God says it is very good. Oh, I'm very pleased with this. You can hear the pleasure in God's voice as he looks at this beautiful creation that God has made. It is good, and then it is very good. So, Lynette, I said, if original means how things were at the very, very beginning, then we need to talk about original blessing and original goodness more than original sin. I don't know if I actually convinced her or not. And after just a couple of minutes, she needed to go on back to her workstation and get her work done. And I know we will talk again very soon and when we do, we'll talk more about original sin and original blessing. And I'm going to throw one more thing into her. I'm going to remind her that that work that she does for our company, that is a part of God's original blessing. That is a part of original goodness. And when I do, I'm going to remind her not of Genesis 1, but of Genesis 2. Genesis 2 is a creation story. There are several creation stories in the Bible. It doesn't conflict with Genesis 1, but rather it offers a contrast. I think God and, and creation is so complex, so marvelous, that we need as many ways to understand it as we can possibly receive. In Genesis 1, we, we've already mentioned that, that God speaks the world into creation. Let there be. 
Let there be the, the sun and the moon. Let there be the earth. Let there be the, the oceans and the land. And all of these things come into being. God can simply be somewhat distant and speak the world and, and all that we know into being. It is a passage that reminds us of God's magnificent power of just being able to speak existence into being. But in Genesis 2, the passage that we've read, and in fact the entire chapter, you see a different way of creation. You, you see God rolling up his sleeves, if you will, and getting his hands dirty and, and just getting in there and, and doing the work of creation. In verse 7 in chapter 2, God forms man from the dust. And in, and in verse 8, God plants a garden that, that you can see God getting out there and, and, and working those rows of, of all kinds of vegetation. God planting a garden in Eden. Genesis 2 portrays a God who knows the value of a day's work. And he also wants his creation to know the value of a day's work. For when God creates humanity, when God creates us, he doesn't just set us over to the side and say, I simply want you to rest and enjoy and, and just do whatever you'd like, but rather God creates humanity with the intent that we will till and keep the earth. That's what we read in verse 15. That as God creates Adam, he puts him in the garden and says, this is a shovel. This is a hoe. Get to work. So many times, though, I think we believe that work is a four-letter word that's been given to us as punishment for our sins. Friends, the scripture teaches us that we were made to till and keep the earth. We were made to, to care and to grow God's creation. Not just in an agricultural standpoint, but in, in all types of work. We were made for work. We were made for a voda. Now, I just found the word avoda a couple of years ago. I was studying at Campbell Divinity School in the Master of Arts in Faith and Leadership Formation program and stumbled across this word avoda. It's a Hebrew word. I had studied Hebrew years ago and, and gracious, I forgot it by the end of the semester, but I don't know that I'd ever run across the word avoda. Hebrew words, just like really any word from any specific language, can be a little difficult for us to pin down into the English. But scholars tell us that avoda means work or service or craftsmanship. And it can also mean worship. Avoda is referenced as the, as the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, as they were making bricks for the Egyptian cities and, and building products, projects. They were practicing a voda. But it's also used as the, the craftsmen were, were knitting together beautiful linen that would perhaps be used in the tabernacle. It's also referenced as Solomon is dedicating the temple practicing avoda and leading in worship and leading in the work of the people of God. In his wonderful book, Work Matters, Tom Nelson says this of avoda. He says, whether it is making bricks, crafting fine linen, or leading others in corporate praise or worship, the Old Testament writers present a seamless understanding of work and worship. Though there are distinct nuances to avoda, a common thread of meaning emerges where work, worship, and service are connected. Avoda is where work, worship, and service all come together. 
Avoda is where we see our work both as an obedience, but also as a gift of praise to, to God. Now, I realize some of you, some of you may have, uh, have retired already, and that's great. But just because you retired, or just because you may not be working in the conventional sense, doesn't mean you're not working. We all have people we can care for. We all have homes that we need to maintain. We can all practice avoda by doing our work to the very best of our ability. But I'll grant you, avoda is not always easy. I've been with Rust Enterprises now for four years this weekend, Labor Day weekend. And over the course of the last four years, I've learned a good bit about people. Prior to that, I had served as a pastor and served in the church, and so I knew a little bit about people then. But as I've gotten into the workplace, I've really learned a few things about people. And in all honesty, it's been quite disheartening at times to see people lie and steal, either from the company or from one of our restaurants. That's always so very discouraging, but... You can call me the eternal optimist that my mother raised me to be if you want to. For every person that has disappointed me, either in lying or stealing from the company in some way, I can point to five or ten or, or even more people who are doing the very best they can to make ends meet, who are working hard. They may not have the concept of a voto, but they're simply trying to give their very best to make a living. One of those fellows was a guy named Isaac. Isaac was about 18 or 19 years old, and he was working in one of our stores. And on this particular day, Kenneth Rust, our co-owner and operator, and I were in the store, and we were visiting and looking around and checking on folks and just seeing how things were going. And you know, it was about lunchtime, and um, Kenneth decided he was going to get something to eat. And so he went up to the counter, and he ordered a Big Mac and fries and a Coke, and got his sandwich, and he went down and to the, one of the tables, sat down and ate, and, and I got my lunch and, and everything. And when Kenneth finished his meal, he got up and went right into the kitchen. And now, this is, this is the owner of the store. Okay, He walks into the kitchen and he says, I want to know who made my sandwich. Well, this 18, 19-year-old, Isaac, without any hesitation, he speaks up and says, well, I did. And Kenneth looked back at him and said, that was a great sandwich. You did an awesome job. You're doing a, you're doing a terrific job. Now, when the owner of the company comes in and gives you a compliment, one might think that the best thing to do would simply be to say, thank you, and go on about your business. But that's not what Isaac did. Instead, this 18-year-old kid looks back at Kenneth and says, well, I didn't make your sandwich any better than I make any other sandwich. A couple of years ago, Kenneth and Lisa asked us to develop a core values program for our company. They gave us the word FRIES and said, make an acronym of that and come up with a core value for each letter in the word FRIES. I'm thankful he didn't say hamburger, <laughs> but FRIES. So we talk about friendliness respect, integrity, excellence, and service. Those are our core values for our company. Th that is my five-point sermon that I preach to all of our employees every day. Friendliness, respect, integrity, excellence, and service. Now, when it comes to Isaac, I'm not sure how I would grade him on respect as he dealt with Kenneth but I give him an A plus 
when it comes to integrity. Doing the right thing regardless of who is watching. We define integrity as living by a high moral standard at all times. We define integrity as being professional and giving your very best effort and doing it right to the best of your ability. Isaac scores an A plus on integrity and I'll give him an A for respect as well. I also believe that Isaac exemplified Paul's word to the Colossians. As I mentioned, Paul is writing in these few verses that we read to a group of people who are living a radically different type of life than we do. He's writing to slaves, people who have no freedom to go and come as you and I have. They work long hours, they work hard jobs, and they have little benefit for the toil that they give to their, their daily existence. I think it would be very difficult for us to fully understand that concept, for we have our freedom, but even in our freedom, I think Paul is speaking to us when he says, whatever your task, Put yourselves into it as done for the Lord and not for your masters. It doesn't matter if you are enslaved. It doesn't matter if you are free. Put your heart into your work as though you are doing it for the Lord and not for your master. I can't imagine hearing that word while enslaved or hearing it while in bondage. For slavery is the worst of sins that, we, that humanity has ever inflicted on one another. But Paul, in this verse, is making a bold statement here in saying that the gospel of Jesus Christ is greater than any circumstance that we find ourselves in. That the gospel of Christ empowers us to see up beyond our current situation. Slaves, yes, you do not have your freedom, but by the gospel of Jesus Christ, live with faith and hope and love and do your work to the very best of your ability as though you are doing it for God and not just for those for whom you work. The power of the gospel is such that we can see greater purposes and possibilities in our daily lives and in our daily work. Perhaps you've heard the legend of the three stonemasons, three men who were doing the same job one day, and a, a fella came up to them and, and asked about their work, and he asked one stonemason, well, what is it that you're doing? And, and the fella just, he, he didn't even look up. He just kept pounding that stone and said, I'm cutting stones. Well, then the fellow walked over to the second fellow and, and said, well, what is it that you're doing? And he, he kind of grunted out, well, I'm just making a living. I'm just trying to, to make enough money to, to put food on the table. And then he went to the third stonemason and asked him, what are you doing? Now, granted, it's the same job. But that third stonemason looked up. He stood up for just a second and stretched and he said, I am building a cathedral for God and his people. They were all three doing the same job, but one of them was doing it with a voda. And of the three, I am guessing that the third was doing the best job. Those stones looked a little bit better than perhaps his co-workers were doing. I'm imagining that third one was doing what Dorothy Sayers said we should do. He was serving the work. Dorothy Sayers lived in England in the 20th century. She was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis. She was a playwright, but she was also something of a practical theologian. And she had a lot to say about the Christian view of work and of avoda and how we are to go about working in this world. She also spoke to the church, and she called the church out for what the church should be saying to each of us as we go about our, our jobs. 
She said the church should not just be telling people to, uh, to, to be good, but also to do good. In her most well-remembered essay, Dorothy Sayers said this, The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk or disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. But what the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. If you're a carpenter, Dorothy Sayers said, your first responsibility as a Christian carpenter is to make good tables. If you're a teacher, your first responsibility as a Christian teacher is to write and to share good lessons. If you're a nurse, your first responsibility as a Christian nurse is to provide compassionate care for your patients. If you're in sales, your first responsibility as a Christian salesman is to find a good product and to make an honest sale. If you're an engineer or a builder, your first responsibility as a Christian is to build good roads. Jacques Martin once said, if you want to produce Christian work, then be a Christian and try to make a work of beauty into which you have put your heart. If you want to make Christian, if you want to, to do Christian work, he said, then be a Christian and try to make your work, whatever it is, a thing of beauty. And then he said, don't just settle for adopting a Christian pose. I wish I had read that line several years ago. During the summers of my college years, I would leave my beloved Bowie's Creek up at Campbell and I'd go back to my beloved hometown of Franklin, Virginia and there I would work in the paper mill as a laborer. The pay was great at that time. It really helped me afford college. It also helped me appreciate college. But in all honesty, I hated the work. I, oh boy, it was hot. long hours, crude folks to work with at times. I, I hated the work. My parents knew it, but it's good for you, son. <laughs> I got so tired of it, and, but at, at, at one point I found Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not unto your masters. And so having to wear a hard hat every day to work I decided what I would do to remind myself of that passage, I would write that scripture reference on my hard hat. And so I got some paint and I painted on Colossians 3.23 onto my hard hat. So every time I put that hat on or took it off, there it was, just to remind me. I was well-intentioned. But in the spirit of a voter, I think what we need to do is write that Verse on our hearts and do good work. Will you pray with me? Lord, we don't come to church just for the opportunity to hear you and to serve you here. Yes, this is a place where we can know you, we can experience you, and on most days, Lord, it's a lot easier to hear you right here than in our workplaces. But Lord, you have given us, each of us, regardless of age or perspective or resources, you've given us each an opportunity to till and to keep your creation, to grow this world so that it does indeed praise you with all of its might. 
Lord, I, I pray that as we go from this place today, we will recognize that we are going into a mission field, but we're going with the ability to do good work in a way that honors you, that fulfills, fulfills the reason for our creation, but it also praises you. Help us, O oh Lord, to practice Aveda with all of our heart. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you would make a commitment to Christ today, or if you would simply like to come and to pray for the strength that you need to face another work week, then I would be glad to come and, and meet you and to pray with you. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. I don't know what this week holds for you. I hope you will enjoy a, perhaps a day off tomorrow. I do know that you have some task ahead of you, whether you are in